Welcome to the Wise Wisconsin Winter Series. This is the fifth in our series, Retirement Refirement. And I'm Jane Jensen, the Lifespan Educator with UW-Madison Extension, Sheboygan County. And hello, this is Karen Dickrell. I'm Lifespan Educator as well with UW Extension Madison. And um, I'm located in Ottagamie County. So I'm going to start to share the screen for our topic today. And here we go. Okay, so when we taught the class, we did ask people some background kinds of information like how many people were retired, how long were they retired, um, and what were some of their kind of aspirations. But because this is a taped um, version, we, we aren't able to do that. But, but the last question I asked on that poll was, what do you need to be, to create fire? And um, it was to, to lead into this next slide, which um, is our whole title of Refirement Retirement. To, to create a fire, we need to have heat, oxygen, fuel, and chemicals. And so what does that have to do with retirement? Well, that's what Jane and I are gonna share with you today, the different elements of how do we create that heat and that excitement in our lives? What kind of oxygen do we need so that we can continue the fire? What fuels our fire? And sometimes we add chemicals as well. So that kind of leads into the whole idea of refirement. So we also asked people, to think about their decision-making because that's one of the key elements of decision-making. Many of the concepts and ideas that we're sharing with you today come from a book called Purposeful Retirement. And we'll re refer to this several times during the course of the class today. Um, and Hiram Smith, W. Smith is, is an author of the book and it really outlined two of the key things that we're gonna talk about initially today. We also asked people to bring a towel to class. <laughs> and Jane, did you bring a towel? <laughs> I did, I have, I bought my best towel. Oh, the best towel the in the best, house. <laughs> the best one. So I asked people to find a bath towel and bring it to the computer and then to fold the towel the way you normally fold your towels. So Jane, if you could, kind of demonstrate for us how you fold your towel. It's a very pretty color. Okay. And there we go. And she has a little ribbon on the outside and you might go, oh, okay, that's kind of how I do mine. Well, I, I brought a towel too uh, and my towels rolled because you know it. that's just what I did. So as we did the class, we asked people to demonstrate how they fold their towels. Jane, how did you come to decide to fold your towel this way? Well, I like this emblem, this nice ribbon right here, but I also fold it in a square because that's how it fits in my linen closet, the best okay. way. So you've got, you've got a reason for why you, you mm -hmm. fold it that way. And we noticed some people when they were folding on, on the class and we did it in person, they were shaking out the towel to get some of the wrinkles out. And some of them folded them in thirds and then in half and then in half again. And, and people had different reasons. And we asked questions of who did it right? And when you have a whole, we had, I don't know how many, Jane, was it 69 people on? <laughs> we did, we did. So like 69 different ways of folding a towel. And, and they all had, you know, different reasons. Some had learned to do it that way. Um, some of them had observed others and thought they liked that style. Um, something that takes me home to Sheboygan County, Jane, I didn't tell this story, but I learned how to fold my towels the way you fold them at Lye's department store, because I worked in domestics. And so we had to have all the towels in the, that department folded the same way. And when people shop for towels, they always, always have to seem to take them off the shelf and, you know, and rearrange them. And then you come back, you go, oh my gosh, here we are. We have to fold towels again. <laughs> so does it make a big difference to people how their towels are folded? 
for some it does because it bothers them because they like to have it a certain way and they like to open their their closet and see all of them neatly lined up. And for others, it's like, heck, I, I'm just glad I've got a clean towel. So it doesn't affect everybody in the same way. And if you fold your towel in a different way, how does it make you feel? Jane, have you had someone do towels for you and you go into the closet and they're done differently? Does it make you feel any different? Well, it, it's, it's problematic because it, <laughs> you know, it needs to be done a certain way or they're not gonna stack up properly. And you it's may not get the way. same number into the, the Absolutely. towel. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. yep. So what does all this have to do with decision making? Well, actually it, it is somewhere along the line you had to make a decision of how you were gonna fold your towels. And some people maybe fold their towels one way and a different way compared to a different bathroom or you know, the environment that they're in. So it does relate to making some decisions. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how important decisions are in our lives and um, the different ways that we make decisions. And I also encourage you the next time that you're folding towels, that you take that time to also think about how am I doing in life? Are things going the way I want them to go? Are there some changes I should make? Should I be looking into something different? So that decision-making continues on, but we'll get into that. So there's different decision-making models that we have in our lives. Um, one is the coin toss. I don't know if you can see my quarter. And maybe if you throw it in the air and you catch it, oh, I catch it and you put it down, it's like, okay, yeah, heads I marry them, tails I don't. Or, you know, it's probably not life-saving, kind of life-changing kind of details. Like, okay, yeah, heads, okay, um, heads, uh, I'm going to retire tomorrow and tails, I'm going to work six more years. Um, you're not going to make those kinds of decisions with a coin toss. But you might use the coin toss to decide, well, where am I going to go grocery shopping this week? Is it store A or store B? Or what am I making for lunch today? Is it a tuna sandwich or am I going to make a tuna melt? Or, you know, what am I going to do? So they're pretty even in your decisions. Then we've got the habits, the decisions by habits. And there's a lot more research and information. I don't know, maybe because I've been studying this more. I'm seeing a lot more information coming out about habits. So um, one of my habits, I've, I've brought along my friend here and she's been around with me for a long time. And when I went to grade school, I had some nuns that were my teachers and they wore, their outfits were called habits. So that kind of re reminded me of good habits that we have. And Jane's gonna talk about some of those good habits later on that we want to develop in our lives you know, to, to make the right decisions. But then there are some habits that maybe we have to fight that we have to make some changes on. And so those are decisions too, to say, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, yeah, if I eat those chocolates, my blood sugars are gonna go up. Or if I don't take a walk, I'm gonna have this. So we wanna get some good habits that we're developing. The next kind of decision is by default, where you don't make a decision. It's just like, it just kind of happens. So um, oh, many years ago, I worked with someone uh, and it was financial management and I asked her to bring her bills with her. And so she brought the bills in and I didn't realize it, but she hadn't opened any of her bills. And so we sat there going through each bill to see what her expenses were. That's a decision by default, which isn't a real good way to operate if you're unlimited um, funds. So, you know, or letting someone else make the decision or saying, I don't care. And maybe you really don't care. But if that's your answer, whenever you're asked about a decision, I don't care. And then, you know, half a day later, you're complaining because you didn't like the decision someone else made. That is an issue. So what we want to move into is the careful decision making. And, and really taking some time to think about what decisions you're making and kind of like a roadmap. Now, most of us don't have roadmaps anymore because we depend on our computers and our phones and, and everything else. In fact, the only map I could find in the house still had Tommy Thompson on it, but that's what he looked like. And now he's the president of the university. So I guess I've got a good picture of him from his younger years. But anyway, um, the map helps us to look at 
where we're going in the future. And when you want to refire your retirement time, it's like, well, what is important to me? What are the goals that I want to achieve? So that careful decision making means we need to find the biggest problem within the problem. So um, maybe it is, you know, you never get out of the house with COVID, that's totally understood, but now things are changing. But what is the biggest problem within the problem? And then figure out what the goal is that you want to accomplish. What's important to you? So is it just getting out of the house? Is it being with people? Is it doing something so you feel real accomplishment? Those are things that you need to ask yourself. And then gather the information as much as you can, reading, talking to people, you know, getting things so that you can examine the alternatives. Well, if I do this, I do this. If I do this, this happens. It's kind of like those theorems. What is that in algebra or? Yeah, I think it's algebra, you have theorems or maybe it's geometry, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, you have this if then, if then. And then to make an action plan and think about, okay, this is what I wanna do. Now, you know, sometimes we wanna eat cherry pie but you don't eat the whole cherry pie. You break it up into pieces and you think about where can I start and then what actions can I take? And then you give your decision some time to work and you evaluate how well it is working. So those are just some key elements to the whole idea of careful decision-making and figure out what your goals are and brainstorm those different kinds of goals. Sometimes you can make them the goals for yourself and that's kind of easier to some respect because you're talking to yourself. But if you have other people that are involved in that goal, then you have to get their opinions and then you have to weigh and sort and, and come up with what the goal is and what's going to be what you work towards. Because there's often this way, that way, and another way. And there isn't a right way to fold your towels. I mean, I did this with some county board members and one of the county board, this is a number of years ago, he looked at me and went, I don't do towels. Okay. <laughs> You know, it's like, all right. And sometimes people are like, I, this is what I'm gonna do. And that's, you don't even think about anything else. But there are usually other ways and other perspectives that we want to think about. So discover more about yourself, explore the options, make a decision and take action. And then the final part there is really evaluating the decision. Was that a good decision or not? Did I enjoy it or didn't I enjoy it? Maybe you do a volunteer kind of event and you think, wow, I really like that. I wanna do more of that. Or it's like, oh, that wasn't quite what I thought it would be, but I think I would like to do this. So evaluating is part of the whole decision-making process as we move through life. So Jane, we're gonna move on to that oxygen and um, what do we need to take care of ourselves? So as Karen said, the second part is oxygen and thinking about what will sustain you. And again, this was really an important chapter in the Purposeful Retirement book by Hiram Smith called Take Care of You. And it really focused on thinking about sustaining ourselves through that retirement and what he talked about was sometimes initially when we retire, we're cleaning out the garage and we're painting the walls and we're organizing everything and so on and so forth. And we feel very productive. But what are you doing to take care of yourself to have a productive refired life in your retirement? And we do facilitate, there's an eight part series called Taking Care of You. And we're really going to be also sharing some of those tools uh, as we think about taking care of yourself. Okay, what I'm gonna ask you to do now, and I love this lake picture. I think it's very calming. I'm gonna pretend it's Lake Michigan, but I know it isn't because there are trees over there, <laughs> but, but I'll just pretend. So we're going to start right away with an activity just to bring us together. So I'll ask you to grab a piece of paper and something to write with. And I just want you to take this moment to think about what's on your mind right now. Thoughts that you have, 
things that you need to do, worries you may have, kind of whatever is bugging you. And we'll give you about a minute to write it down on a piece of paper. And of course, in our live class, we did assure people that this was not to be shared. This is just your personal time. So we'll give you about a minute. I'll give you about a minute and I will time you just to write down as much as you can in a minute. Five, four, three, two, one. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to take this piece of paper, turn it over, set it aside. You might pick it up later uh, when you finish the session or sometime later. Or you might decide to just leave it or you might pick something off the list that's doable today and do that. So just to remind ourselves, and sometimes we call this a brain dump. I'm, I'm more fond of calling it all as well, but just to kind of get those things out of our mind and set them aside so we can be mindful of what we're doing, what we're doing right now, or maybe even prioritizing what we need to do. And maybe we, we don't need to do any of it. And just thinking about all is well, we're not thinking about everything that's going on in our lives, just being here right now, all is well. And that doesn't mean that what you wrote down is gone. It just means that you've set it aside for now and allowing you to open your mind and look at things a little bit differently. So thinking about how do you fill up your gas tank? And often we overextend ourselves, you know, to meet the demands of our life. We've got all these retirement activities or paid employment or volunteer, extracurriculars, family. So compare your life a little bit to driving a car. And if we don't fuel that tank in that car, it will run out of gas over time. And just the same, if we don't recharge ourselves, the same will happen and we'll burn out over time. So I will just encourage you to remember, we wouldn't criticize our cars if we forgot to put gas in the tank. So we shouldn't criticize ourselves for becoming drained or emotionally. And that's what I'm kind of saying, we, sh we don't, we sh I shouldn't should upon ourselves. S-H-O-U-L-D, just to make sure. <laughs> and, thinking about things, I'm going to ask you to think about some things that give you positive energy and that it could include joy or peace or comfort. And we'll just give you some time um, on the back side of that piece of paper. And in our, in our group, we had people annotate, but you can just write these down and think about three ways that you can take care of yourself. What are these ways that bring you positive energy? So just write down three ways. And I'll just give you a little time to do that. But some folks wrote, wrote things down like their friends, family, walking, painting, dancing, Karen might say, play your French horn. 
Uh, I might say cross country skiing, but thinking about some of those things. And I'll just give you another half a minute to do that and time, and time you down. But we shared some really great ideas in class and it really inspired me. I think people were hopeful <laughs> with the gardening. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because the snow is, is finally melting. So, and I can even see that in my yard, like the big ice piles, and I can see where my little garden was and my raspberry sticks. So five, four, three, two, one. But hopefully you all have at least three ideas that you can share. Okay. So this is a neat piece that, that came from our Purpose for Retirement book by Hiram Smith. And I just have to tell you, since I, I come from Sheboygan County, when I moved here, uh, I actually found out there was an or Sheboygan Organ Society. So I thought maybe that's what we were talking about <laughs> in this piece um, from the book. But I will read this to you. And I actually went to some of the concerts of the Sheboygan Organ Society. So actually playing organs. So this is what uh, Mr. Smith, the author says. I hate organ recitals. And I believe I've invited to too many of them. Have you attended an organ recital lately? They can be tragic events. Retirees get together and talk about their organs. Which one is acting up? Which one has threatened to stop working? Which one is actually working too much? Some people really get into their own organ recital. To me, they are as depressing as, well, you know what? H-E double hockey sticks. I won't say, I won't say the word. But some people say, well, I have six dents and I have nine and I've had four knees replaced and, and so on and so forth. So he said, and so it goes, if you're attending too many organ recitals, you need to get new friends. And if you're participating in an organ recital, stop. Stop it right now. Find something else to talk about. So uh, just kind of a humorous, humorous piece. But I think we've all um, been part of organ recitals in the past. And now we'll move on to the next slide. Responding versus reacting. So think back to last week. When did you react? And when did you really take the time to respond? And a piece again out of our Taking Care of You series, we focus on responding versus reacting, you know, really taking that time to respond. And if we take that time to respond or we're choosing to respond, it develops awareness. So in that prefrontal cortex of our brain, where that critical thinking occurs, it really helps strengthen that. And also if we respond, we have a slighter response in our stress hormones, so a lower stress response. And when we respond to stress, Think about being aware of our body sensations, really assessing our thoughts and our feelings, our perceived threats and feelings are just what they are, to stay in the moment and being conscious of the present and, and view that situation with openness and without judgment and then to accept. And we think about those positive ways of coping, seeing those new options and life's challenges and also the importance of the nurturing, the self-care, physical movement, problem solving, as Karen talked about in the beginning, some of that decision-making so that we do have um, improved well-being in our health, quicker recovery, calmness, reduced risk of health problems and illness, and a more positive mood and happiness. And I just wanted to share a story that I have permission to share my neighbor she was talking about um, that her friends, I think it was in her cribbage group, they had all been able to have the vaccine, both vaccines already, and she hadn't even been able to have one. And I said, oh, we all want to get together and we want to go out to eat, 
celebrate the end of the pandemic, so to speak, and celebrate getting together with Cribbage. And she said she sat back and she thought about it, accepted their decision, thought about her feelings, listened without judgment. And she just said to them, you know, I'm waiting for my turn for the vaccine. I'm sure it will be soon. I'll look forward to future opportunities uh, when we have that opportunity to get together and have our cribbage group. And she said, I responded then that way, instead of saying, I can't believe you'd be so insensitive. You know I haven't had the chance to have the vaccine. You're just not thinking about me and really choosing her response to that situation. So as you go into the next week or next time, just think about, am I choosing my response? or am I reacting? So now we're going to do another little activity. And often in the, you know, I referred to the Taking Care of You series and we focus a lot on our breath because our breath is always with us. I find it a great way um, to just take a deep breath, let it out, just to kind of lower my, lower my stress response. And we're going to try one. I'll ask you to join me called extended breath. And sometimes it's called a cooling or cleansing breath. And I'll invite you to sit safely in your chair. If you feel safe, you can close your eyes or just lower them to the floor. Set your feet on the ground. Align your spine, you know, kind of roll the shoulders back. Open up the chest and in the yoga world, that's kind of, we're saying we're accepting light and love in our heart. And just gently close your eyes. And I'm gonna ask you to do this three times with me. So take a deep breath in through your nose, expanding the chest, filling the belly. And this is when we really can stick out that belly, that's okay. And then exhale through the mouth, really squeezing your core to push that breath out. And then you're releasing what is no longer serving you, okay? So breathe in through your nose, expanding that chest, sticking out that belly, releasing that breath, releasing what's no longer serving you. And one more time, taking that deep breath through your nose, expanding your chest, sticking out that belly, squeeze out that core, push that breath out, release what's no longer serving you. And when you're finished, just let your breath return naturally. Gently wiggle your toes and fingers, roll those shoulders back, gently blink your eyes open, come back to the room and just remember any time you have your breath to release that stress. Okay. And the next piece of take care of you is the importance of those social connections. You know, that support to other people, who gives that to you and as we talk about the intersection. So I'm going to ask you to draw on your piece of paper and with your writing instrument, two intersecting circles. And our circles aren't quite round on the slide, but I think you get the idea. Just draw two circles that have an intersecting point, okay? And I'm gonna ask you in the left circle or the left side of the screen, write in as many as you can, I will give you about a minute, the help and the roles that you provide to people in your life. For example, I might write, I'm an excellent listener. I listen without judgment. So I'll give you a minute to write as many roles as you can that you help and support other people in your life.
five, four, three, two, one. Now what I'll ask you to do is I'll give you about a minute in the right circle, write the things that you need support or advice or assistance with. And so what I wrote in mine is I really need somebody to give me advice on my car. Also um, a financial planner to give me some advice or support in terms of my investments. So I'll give you about a minute to do that and as many as you can within a minute. So five, four, three, two, one. So as you look, look at your list on the right, can you easily name the people in your life that you have to provide that support? And as we think about the people we need in our lives, we really want to work to identify how their gifts and strengths can support us you know, in our goals or our hopes and our dreams, but also realize that no one person can meet all our needs. So we may have different people in our lives that help us with their mental health. There might be um, a professional, mental health counselor, therapist, somebody to help with finances, might be a, a financial educator or someone to encourage us to stay healthy. And now let's look back on that left-hand side and as you look at the roles you serve for other people, look at that center. Do you see balance? Are you feeling that you're being asked to do things that might not be best suited for you? So for me, it might be an example, and I had somebody that asked me about um, her investments. And I listened, I was supportive. And at the same time, I encourage that individual to contact uh, a financial advisor or financial educator. Or um, if somebody would ask me, oh, let's say the latest thing on preschoolers. Well, I would say, well, you know, I haven't taught preschoolers in about 20 years. And I used to, uh, but I might encourage someone then to go forth call the warm line at the Family Resource Center or take a parenting class or look at some are really parenting the preschool newsletters, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so really um, encouraging folks, you know, or I need to look for somebody in terms of advice of fixing the car or finding that trusted person uh, at the local dealership. I actually did find a, a woman in the, um, in the fix it department, service department, fix it, service department. And she was so helpful. So when our social bonds are balanced, we have those boundaries and we feel comfortable, they're really going to contribute to our overall health. And our next activity is talking about learning to play. And one way that we strengthen our connection with our friends, families, coworkers is to laugh, have fun, and it's also one way to really nurture the spirit dimension of our health. And cultivating happiness in our lives really has lots of effects, emotionally, socially, physically. And just to remind ourselves, sometimes when we think of play, we think, well, it's something only children do. 
Uh, but often as we get older, we play less and we may stop playing altogether. And I love this quote, I wrote it down. We don't stop playing because we grow old, but rather we grow old because we stop playing. So I'm going to read these through and you can either do in, you know, wherever you're listening, thumbs up, thumbs down. Karen and I will play along and I'll, I will read them and then you can go thumbs up or thumbs down. So it's an or thing. Would you rather play in the snow or the grass? Would you rather take a trip to the city or the country? Are you an observer or do you like to be in the thick of things? Classical music or rock and roll? I sound so baby boomer when I say rock and roll, but. Would you rather ride in a convertible or an SUV? Ride on a Harley Davidson or a bicycle? Travel by plane or train? Tai Chi, you know that. Mm -hmm or line dancing. Great, and we had lots of folks that um, shared so many ideas about games they played. We saw lots of people in the country or in the grass. I think people are very excited about gardening. So I think they were looking forward, forward to the grass. So, but just to remind you in the next week, think about how you're going to play for your mental health. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, that's great, Jane. Lots of things to think about. So our next component is fuel. What makes us combust and make us feel like we're making a difference? Um, some days you can feel the difference and other days it's like you wonder and it's just they blend, they blend one into the other kind of groundhog day. And that's kind of been the pandemic when you think about, oh my gosh, it's been a year. How have we been doing this? Um, but Monday, just recently, Jane helped um, me do a ripple mapping of our caregiver coalition. And it was great to hear people um, talk about the impacts that the caregivers are doing um, in, in our county. And it energized people. You could just see as they were telling their stories and things, how that made them feel like they were making a difference. So those kinds of um, experiences are important to all of us throughout our lifespan of looking at how we're making a difference. There's three basic um, emotions that we have. One is we fear, well, if I don't do that, what's going to happen? Or duty, I have to do that because that's my role. If I don't do it, no one else will. Change the toilet paper? Well, we all could do that. You know, so it's a matter of perspective. And then love, and yes, we all want to love and be loved. And so those emotions come into play as we look at refiring our retirement. And one of the quotes from Hiram Smith in, in his book was, I've retired, unretired, and retired again all in the past 10 years. I find the biggest trouble with having nothing to do is you can't tell when you're done. And you know, when you had your work and your jobs, you oftentimes had expectations and deadlines and you're like, oh, I'll never get through all this. But we have to kind of take that step back and think about now if we're in retirement or getting ready for retirement, how are we going to feel fulfilled? What are we going to do because we want to do it or because it's something others expect of us? And in the end, you make the decisions of what you're gonna do and how you use your time. My friend Judy was a teacher and she retired and I saw her in the fall. So she had a couple months that she was retired and not in the school system. And I asked her, how is it going? And she said, you know, the first couple of weeks were okay, but I just felt lost. Like I wasn't accomplishing anything. And she said, you know, Karen, I'm back to having a to-do list because I just needed to have that list to help me organize of what I wanted to do and how I was going to feel fulfilled. 
So it wasn't so much that fear, but it was just her sense of accomplishment and how she viewed that in life. So we've talked in the last other sessions and even earlier today in this session with Jane of what do you feel passionate about and um, what's important to you and what do you want to um, bring into your life? And the other series we've asked, what brings you joy? And how do you find joy in your life? And it may be different seasons of the year that bring you joy um, and things that you look forward to. But it's those questions that help to refire us and to take that step back and think about what do we want to do and how are we going to redo it. So maybe it's a different job or it's a way of life. And the job, and I think my picture is covering up that top um, statement there, but it's the job does not to be um, does not need to be paid with a paycheck. But some people do need to go back to work and help supplement what they have coming in um, and because they, maybe they need the resources or they simply want to have that adventure. I was telling the other day that a friend of mine is sewing for the Packers. She got hired by the company that, that does the sewing for the Packers uniforms. And you know, it's a whole new adventure for her and things that she's learning and, and she's had fun doing it. Um, but there's also things that you can volunteer for. So Jane, can you think of some things that we've got a list here that people can read what are some things that you've heard people are volunteering for in their retirement? Well, again, a couple of really neat things in, in my community is that I know folks that are making weekly phone calls. We have this really neat organization, the Plymouth Intergenerational Center, and they are volunteers. So they're making weekly phone calls to people out in the community, you know, just to connect, um, catch up with them, See how they're doing. And another friend of mine in our local uh, residential community hospice, she's a trained volunteer, so has gone through very specific training as part of the hospice, but then she's making follow-up calls to family members, you know, to see where they are, see how they're going at, at you know, in terms of that follow-up. So there's lots of ways to do that even without being physically there, you know, things that you can even do from, from your home. Mm -hmm. All you need is a, is your phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know people that have sewn hundreds of the face masks early on and now they're getting called back to help to make some, because you know, people are, they're wearing out or they need more because they're wearing them so much, but those kinds of things, if you've got the sewing machine and some people tell me they have stashes of fabric in their house <laughs> and, and putting it to good use. Um, and some of you have been 4-H leaders for many, many years. And you did that when you were working as well. But now maybe you have time to, to give in a different way in retirement. So to think about how you can give back or volunteering at your schools when they open up again and um, being like um, the Wisconsin bookworms and, and reading to children, it just open so many different venues, you're with kids and they give that excitement. I mean, hearing kids laugh and just the fun things that they do can re-energize you as well. So there's lots of things you can do. Um, and, you know, um, I was in Hortonville and this, they've got a new van system. So they're looking for volunteers that can drive people to their appointments. They have the van, they, they can pay for the fuel, they need your time. And oftentimes you can find that in your community. So it might be a different kind of job or a different way of life, but you're touching and making a difference. Mm -hmm. You can learn new things, um, study great literature, form a book club. That book that we've been referring to, Purposeful Retirement, I was part of a book read, now I am working, but we had people from uh, at least five states that were part of this. Some were retired and some were extension people because we were gonna be using the book in our programs. But it was just great fun because this book provides um, study guide questions at the end. So if you read it by yourself, it's okay and you can talk to yourself. <laughs> but I find that being in a book club or a book study, you know, you hear different perspectives because you, when you're reading it yourself, you've got your perspective, but then you hear how other people are applying it and you think, oh, I never thought of it that way. So you get some great ideas. You can learn a new word of the week. 
You could learn to cook. <laughs> and maybe you've been a cook for a long time, but to try some other things or to teach others how to cook. Um, I put some stuff on Facebook this week and one lady said, oh, I can't wait to try this with my twins. So she has twins in her neighborhood and the, she, she you know, helps them to learn new things that maybe their parents don't have time for. You could learn to play in a musical instrument, the ukulele or the kazoo. Um, those kinds of um, music appreciation just yeah, does a lot for that brain development and also bringing oxygen into your body as well. Learning a new language. Um, anything, Jane, that you've heard about people that they've learned in retirement? I have found a lot of people, um, they have audited some of the continuing education classes ah. through our two-year campus and just some really awesome things like Spanish, one, two, three, and four, photography, uh, things on your computer, all sorts of things. So some of that, the continuing ed stuff is really mm -hmm. a great way to learn to learn some new skills. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I would encourage everybody to give it a shot. And when we could travel and when we can travel again, I have a friend that's done study tours and, and she went as a single person and she said, oftentimes people will adopt you <laughs> into their oh, yeah. little groups, yeah. but, you know, traveling around and studying certain things, certain geographies and um, just fascinating to, to see and learn about other parts of the United States and um, taking those little tours of things that are right here in our backyard. I've got a friend that I noticed this week, they're out looking at all the state, um, state parks. And so they're taking pictures of all the state parks as they get there and places I've never heard of, but um, little nooks and crannies throughout the state of Wisconsin. So you can learn a lot from, from those kinds of adventures. Creating a legacy, that sometimes people feel very important in their retirement of what am I gonna leave this earth when I'm gone? What will people remember? So I know Jane, you had some ideas that you helped with this list. Are there any of that you wanna specifically um, talk about? I think that that's something that some folks have really found useful. And I even did this myself with my grandmother is really doing those interviews with family members and either recording that, you know, documenting that um, so that you remember some of those things. And, you know, my grandmother is long gone, but I will never forget writing down those stories um, when she grew up in the town of Lucas in Dunn County. Um, some of the folks that would come to visit and um, the visits with Native Americans that would come to the door was just things I had never heard of before. And I was so thankful uh, that I had done that. And then I had written it down mm -hmm. for her. So it's, it's storytelling yeah. is very important. Yeah. 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 Great. And Thank even, you. And I was even thinking of, and, and when we create those scrapbooks or photo albums, it's always helpful to identify what those things are, <laughs> our um, photos of, because I think we've all gotten these piles and piles of, of photographs. We want to make sure we know who those people are. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You really can't see it over my shoulder, but there's a box underneath the table and a pretty box. It's a upholstered box, but it's a family history. So as my uncle passed on, he passed information to my parents as they passed on, it was this big box of stuff and everybody looked at each other and it's like, what are we gonna do with it? And I, I don't know, but that's my retirement, retirement <laughs> project waiting, I think, um, because much of it has been organized. And like you said, you know, if you don't write it down or identify the people in the pictures, it's like, what good is it? Um, so, yeah, so my little box is <laughs> waiting there. Um, in a couple of years, we'll be able to look at it. So it's those legacy kinds of things, the ways that you de define what family is and how you share family is, is really important. I think Facebook has opened up for some families some new opportunities to get to know relatives that you never knew you had and um, to, to trace some of your family roots and, and do those kinds of 
um, memory lane kinds of things and putting the pieces together and the connections, really important. And it gives a feeling of sense and rootedness for us. Great ideas, thank you. So the fourth component is happiness, the chemicals, the purposeful happiness, the things that are going to bring that joy and those feelings um, that lighten us up and help us to see the way. So what makes you happy? And so this is where, again, thinking if you have some time, how have you found your happiness during COVID? A year ago, Jane and I would never have guessed we would be doing videos together or teaching together on Zoom like this. And it really has, um, I don't know if it's brought you happiness, Jane, <laughs> but you know we've learned some new things and it's a new sense of accomplishment. Um, and I, I remember a couple of weeks ago, we had, um, it's an all relative group, which is in Otagami County, for grandparents and other relatives, aunts and uncles coming together that are raising their relatives' children. And so they've got some serious things that they have to do. But we had a great grandfather come on that was very happy to be with the group. And he learned how to use the computer and Zoom through his great granddaughter who he is parenting right now. So he was, I mean, it just, it just came through as he was telling his story. So how have you found happiness during COVID? And, and some of us has been baking bread. <laughs> um, some of it has been the phone calls and the different things. Maybe you've been doing a lot of reading. Um, maybe you have started that family cookbook. So how do you find that happiness? And does the sun shining make a difference? So today we're, we're taping and yes, the sun is shining and it's actually kind yes. of warm out. <laughs> it is, it is. And I just wanted to say, Karen, I think that what I have found is just these connections that have been formed through um, Zooming with other people, you know, mm -hmm. folks that I might not have gotten to know as well or had the opportunity to work with on projects. So it's right. been, yeah. I found it to be just an incredible experience teaching with you, but also also with other folks that I haven't had the yeah. chance to get to know or work, you know, I know I knew for a long time, but some other right. folks that right. I hadn't known before. And I just right. think it's wonderful. And, and we've been able to do classes like powerful tools for caregivers Absolutely. and people were, be able, were able to do that from the comfort of their homes and um, learned a lot from each other. And we thought, oh, I don't know how this is going to work over, you know, this platform, but it, it worked. It's not the same as being in a room together with people and eating food because food always brings us together. Um, but um, we've, we've learned to overcome some of that and to find the sunshine in their life. So kind of as part of one of our closing activities, um, I'm gonna, um, I'm not bringing out my French horn or my piano, but I'm bringing out my handy dandy kazoo. And um, you, can, uh, you can sing along if you like, um, or just hum along or whatever. But I'll, we'll do one version of You Are My Sunshine. So. I did my breathing exercise that way through the kazoo. Um, you know, because you're breathing and you're bringing more oxygen to your brain, but it's that music too. So sometimes it's the upbeat music that you play and listen to. Um, it's the people, it's the smiles. When we did this class with 69 people, I didn't see everybody, but as I was playing, I could see people on screen and they were, they were you know, singing along and laughing and smiling. And um, so music can do that for you and bring that sunshine to your soul. So in, in summary, our retirement retirement topic today, we talked about heat and the decisions and how that makes us sometimes tense, but we know that that's a part of life. The oxygen, Jane talked about taking care of you and the key elements to that of what do you do? What do others do? And how do they intersect and, and come together? Taking time for yourself to breathe. 
And to do some of that self-analysis is really important. And then fueling it of what kinds of things do you like to do now that we're starting to come out of the pandemic as things start to open up more, choosing the things that are important to you that you want to spend your time on is very important to find that happiness and, and bring that joy to your life. So our resources again, as we said before, The Purposeful Retirement was a book that we both read and, and used in um, some of our examples and things that we wanted to cover in the class. The Taking Care of You is an extension program of Missouri and Wisconsin Extension. The Retirement Life Plan Workbook that I've got that I'm personally going to start someday. <laughs> um, a book called The New Retirementality by Mitch Anthony. And then Refine Your Life, A Guide for Those Who Can't Retire, Don't Want To by James Gamboni. Um, Faden Fully Love Krause and Chris Kniep were both um, professor emeritus, taught, taught a similar class like this in the early, well, 2011, 12 timeframe. And so we took some of their information as well and we adapted it, but really incorporated the purposeful uh, retirement with what we shared with you today. So we encourage you to use those resources to think about what's still circling in your mind from today's resource um, that we shared. You can email either Jane or myself, or um, you'll be getting an email, or you did get an email probably to link you to the video so you can respond to Sarah, um, who is our program manager, and um, let us know if there's some topics you'd like us to cover in the future. That'd be great. So the next topic, which I don't know if <laughs> you'll find a video on this eventually. I'm absolutely positively aging and that'll be with Ruth Schriefer. So thank you for attending. Any closing thoughts, Jane? Thank you everyone for spending time with us and I wish you well as you refire or you think about retirement. But I think the things that we talked about today can be important pieces of our life at any point. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Yep, it was great doing this together. So long, everyone. <laughs>